So, today is December 4th, 2006. We're at the home of Dave Thompson at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans Oral History Project. Welcome, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. I uh, want to thank you for uh, participating in this project. No problem. Okay. <laughs> Let's start out, if we can, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, when and where you were born. I was born in Superior, Nebraska in 1922. Uh, any uh, siblings? No. Your si only child? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what did what did your folks do for a living? Shoemaker. My dad was a shoemaker. So was my granddad. Huh. I ended up doing that for a while too. <laughs> okay. For several years in Fort Collins, the shoe hospital. What uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you were doing prior to entering the service? Well, <clears throat> graduated in '41. Fort Collins High, and uh, the day after I graduated, I went to California, another guy and I, and ended up getting a job, uh, well, trying to get a job in uh, Douglas Aircraft, but I didn't have the right deal there, you know, for a while. So I, I worked for Safeway stocking shelves, then I came back home, and uh, I came back home in, in about two weeks why Douglas Aircraft called me. Huh, after you'd come back home? Yeah, huh. uh, no, I had to go, go back to Long Beach and, and uh, work on, at the uh, Douglas Aircraft there. Why did you, uh, were you, did you have an interest in aircraft or why did you go to California to, to get on with them? Oh, we, at that time, uh, California was where you could make more money. Gotcha. <laughs> and uh, uh, had to take a course in sheet metal is what I did. And before the war went in, uh, it was going, going, you know, but uh, I was making uh, A-20 bombers. At this point, were they uh, uh, making the bombers for us or for England or? For the, us. Uh, okay. A-20 is a... Uh, is, uh, uh, for us, yeah. Okay. And do you remember where you were and what you were doing when uh, uh, you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was driving towards uh, Douglas Aircraft. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> uh. and I, I couldn't believe it. I'll tell you. But uh, I worked there for a couple, three years. I can't remember how long now. But anyway, ended up. Uh, going into the service. Did you enlist or were you drafted? I was drafted. Okay. Yeah. Even with your uh, job there at Douglas, that didn't yeah. disqualify you from... Uh, well, probably, uh, some of the guys did, it did yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I went in. And you were drafted by the uh, U.S. Army? Yeah. Okay. And I, I don't really know how I ended up in the Air Force. You know, I don't filled all, all those papers up and I don't know how they came up put me in the Air Force. So after you were drafted, <clears throat> how much longer then thereafter before you took off for boot camp? It was pretty quick. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, had to, in, went to St. Petersburg, Florida for uh, basic training or whatever you call it, and uh, then I can't, couldn't tell you how many other bases I was at, but ended up flying in the uh, 8th Air Force. 8th Air Force. When did you, uh, uh, at what point along those various stops did you link up with your crew as a whole? Uh, the crew got together and, uh, oh boy, it was in Oregon. We ended up going back to Shadburn, Nebraska. Oh, is that right? 
anywhere near your uh, your hometown? Not too far from. Yeah. yeah. So you were, you were able to get home before you took off for overseas? Oh no, no. Uh, uh, we weren't living there then. We came out. And oh, okay. We moved. To, everybody moved to California. Folks too. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, but uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, it was long ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. But uh, uh, in '43, I ended up going overseas. '43. Uh, now, did you guys fly over, or did you t did you ship over? Well, the way it ended up, uh, our crew stayed together all the time, uh -huh. and we ended up the whole squadron went over at the same time, and. Uh, uh, landed in uh, England. Well, but did you guys all fly uh, over in formation, or did you did you take a ship over? How did you get over we to flew, England? We flew over, okay. but uh, uh, no formation or yeah. anything like that. Because it's too damn many of them. <laughs> and uh, first time, time we landed in Liverpool, and. Uh, <laughs> We ended up there, and, and uh, the runway was slick for some reason or other, and we ran off the runway, got stuck, so we had to stay there for a day or two huh. before we went on to our, our main, main base. Now, prior to, to joining the service and getting into the Air Corps, had you ever flown before? No. Huh. Do you remember your first your first time up? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you talk, tell may, us a little bit about that. Made made you go, take a few deep breaths. <laughs> huh. Yeah. No, I enjoyed it though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Beautiful scenery, you know. How was uh, and then how did you uh, do? You have any idea how you became chosen to be a, a waste gunner? Or how that how that took place? I don't know. Yeah. I really don't. Yeah. It. Uh, all through the paperwork, and uh, well, I had to go through gunnery school in Las Vegas, for one thing. Now, how they took me for that, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. But uh, we had to uh, in Las Vegas. We had to uh, learn how to shoot the guns, and then get up and, and eight, we ended up getting an AT sixes. If you know what they No, if you can explain that to yeah. to us. And, uh, it's a two uh, a, a fighter type deal, and it's a two uh, two cockpits, one ahead of the other. And I had the the we had the the gunners trainers. I had to sit in the back one because I had a gun, and we go up and. Shoot at the, there was another plane taking a, uh, uh, drag a sheet, a big round sheet, I don't know how long it was, but, and you fired at that. Huh. It, it would fly along and they go along together, you fire, have fired at that, because the wind drill, you got to fix that, you know. Huh. Were they, were they pretty accurate, those guns? Well, the guns were, Depended oh. on who got the guy driving, uh, uh, shooting it. <laughs> so you kind of had to estimate wind speed and airplane speed to, to, to get to your target? To get, yeah, yeah, to get to the target. Yeah. Okay. So you guys, uh, with the 8th Air Force, you were based in, uh, based in England? Yeah. We ended up in England. Uh huh. And, uh, what, what were base conditions like uh, there? Not too good. No. <laughs> but I keep thinking back, you know, after we started flying. I was up here, and I was looking at those guys down on the ground, and I got thinking, I'm glad I'm here, because if I get back from the mission, I got a bed to sleep in, food to eat, and everything like that. Not a dry... Uh, Water or uh, foxhole. Foxhole, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Uh, then how much uh, <clears throat> once you were, how soon after you guys landed in England and got situated, did you start running missions? Yeah, I, I don't know how quick it was. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, yeah. We started starting, flying. and uh, our whole group was all new. And uh, but we started flying in. Can you can you describe a mission? What uh, what a mission would an ordinary if there was an ordinary mission, what it was like, uh, particularly from your viewpoint. Uh, explain what it's like in the airplane. Uh, just talk a little bit about some of your missions. <coughs> well, like like that mission uh, we had met in the North Sea. That was our second mission to Berlin. And uh, your, your second mission to Berlin or Berlin or your second mission that the second mission that you had run. You, Second mission we had run. That was our second one coming back. Oh, geez, almost right off the bat, then, huh? Yeah. Talk. But, but that uh, that was that was the fourteenth mission was the mission I went in the North Sea. We got to that from Berlin, and uh, uh, it's cold up there. And uh, one day, came back from a mission, and. In the huts, we had what's what's in the huts, uh -huh. and we had three crews at each mission. Uh, in, the, in there, and I came back one time. The guy from New York, I don't remember what his name is, but uh, he looked like somebody had laid, put him up against a wall and just started beating the hell out of one side of his head. But that was frostbite. So you see, your oxygen mask, you had to keep it uh, open for exhale. And sometimes it would freeze up. Now, that's how cold it gets. See. And uh, so I had a short one one day. <laughs> but uh, you gotta, gotta keep those masks open. You were saying that uh, from your position, you basically just opened a, opened the door, so you had the cold air blowing in on you, right? Well, well yeah, I showed you the way the port fortress was, and you know the radio room is uh, has has a gun on top. He has to open that up, and then down here we're down here in the back there, and we open ours up, so that wind's going right straight through you. You know how how what I did what, uh, when we went on a mission like that. Took my winter uh, underwear, long john too, put them on. On top of that, I put uh, we had a put our electric suits on. On that, I put my summer flying suit. And then on that, I put my winter flying suit. And I've got a picture here someplace I was going to show you that what, I, what it was like. But, uh, it was cool. What were you saying? It got upwards to 40 below zero? Oh, yeah. 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 Occasionally, it depended on how high you went. At one time, we had to go to, uh, up pretty high to go over a storm. And, uh, there, there was one time we were in that storm, uh, uh, trying to get out of it, and uh, ended up get, coming out of the clouds. And here we're going this way, and here comes another group coming this way. <laughs> we were lucky. Uh, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, how, now, how often would it be between missions? How much time would you have off between? Oh, I, I don't know. No, I, no. Just, uh, yeah. Depending on how good your plane was, you know. Around. One time, uh, uh, some guys had to put, take our plane, and they ended up going in the drain. Yeah. So we we ended up going through three planes. <laughs> uh. The first ditched in one, and. The other one, 
uh, the we were uh, coming in, uh, checking them out before we were flying, you know, the, and uh, came in uh, on our base, and the uh, runway was slick. Well, we didn't know it, of course, there was no communication. A guy in the head of us had run off the runway, got stuck, and we come along and our wing, like this, our wing went right across the top of him. So I, we got shot up another plane. <laughs> so the one I went to Sweet then was our third plane. Uh, wow. <laughs> we'll talk about your two, uh, your two ditches here in a second. Uh, but <clears throat> could you talk about uh, what it's like uh, being under attack by fighters and, and, and going over your bomb run and, and flak coming up and, and your viewpoint seeing below the, the bombing and talk a little bit about from your vantage point what, what it was like to be a, a waste gunner on one of these these well, flights. It's, uh, it was scary. <laughs> uh, we had on the bottom of our uh, window we had uh, protect we had uh, metal down there but that was just a square and you had to, I, when you're set there, oh, I had a, a, a case of uh, gun uh, shells that I set on. Because so many guys, the flak came up through the door, bought of it, and they got them in the butt. So all the time I was flying, I, had, I was sitting on a bunch of 50 caliber machine gun. Uh, and uh, uh, but it, it was cold. You had to sit there, and, and the flak was the thing that scared the hell out of me. We had uh, fighters that hit us too, but uh, that was kept your, you kept thinking about something else other than that shrapnel. There's been, there were times that, that we, on one of our trips that just a, a block, a, a black explosions going on. And that black was was the thing. Okay. Was there any worries, uh, not only from coming up from from below, but with your windows open, it coming in through the oh, window? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One oh. one mission. Uh, I think it was the one that I told you we had uh, 143 black holes. It felt like somebody kicked me in the shin. But the way it worked, like I told you, what all we had was that shrapnel went through everything except the long underwear. It didn't break. It didn't cut me or anything. Uh. <coughs> so. You just stop and think back how lucky you think you are. Wow. <laughs> uh, and what was the view looking down? Can you describe what, a, from your viewpoint, the bombing below could... Uh, well, you, uh, you couldn't really put your head out the window. Mm. You know, uh, I had a camera. Sometimes you, you, they gave you a camera to take pictures, but even then you had to put the camera out to take the picture. But you, after you get by, you can see the black smoke and everything come out. Yeah. yeah. So, but, uh, uh, yeah, the 14th edition, I, I told you. Yeah, let's talk about your two, uh, your two missions now where you, you had to, had to uh, scuttle the plane. When we first started out there, we, if you had got 25 visions, then you'd go home. And coming back from Berlin that time, and running out of gas, that was my 14th mission. While we were sitting out there fishing, <laughs> didn't catch a fish. <laughs> While I was sitting out there fishing, they changed it and raised it up to 35. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, what was it like to to to, to crash land? You, I, 
you crashed you crash landed into the ocean in North Sea. Yeah. What was uh, how did you prepare yourself for that? What were you thinking when that? Well, I, I, <laughs> I could tell you. Ah, <laughs> uh, please. But, uh, uh, when you get ready to ditch, the guys up front who don't have to go away in place, but uh, the rest of us got into the radio room, like this is a nose. We got in the radio room and you put your back to the front. And we're all laying set down. They had the, that ball turret I told you about, you know. Uh, we hit once, and then we hit the second time. And the second time, that ball turret came up and broke into the radio room. But it was lucky. That's what I was thinking about later on, you know, when uh -huh. I was telling you how lucky things worked out. Because we had to get out of the radio room and get up on top of the ship and then get on the wing and get into those rubber rafts. They popped out. We didn't, we didn't have to sit and blow them up. They were uh, fixed up where they were. But uh, got up on top out of the wing, and there we were. Uh, <laughs> wow. But uh, if, if it wasn't for that ball turret coming in there, we stepped on it to get out of the window. So, uh -huh. so that's one good thing that happened. <laughs> uh, so you, you got out of the, out of the plane and, and onto your rafts. Uh, did the plane sink then right away? or? Uh, I don't know who had the time, but uh, one, of the, one of the guys on the crew said it took about 45 minutes for the plane to ditch. And all, the entire crew got off okay? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The only deal uh, when the, we hit the water, or when they hit, the second time we hit the water, that old truck came up. The uh, navigator Ended up, he was sent down front. He circled him up and he cracked his jaw, but that was about it. Uh, 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 so you're out in these rafts. How long were you guys out in the raft before? Uh, uh, did you send it a May Day? Did somebody know oh, that you? We, yeah, we had, uh, uh, they, had, they had these little deals, radios, uh, that you could put between your legs turn it on, you crank it all the time, and it's an SOS deal. And uh, uh, you put an antenna up, a box antenna up for it. But uh, we sat there and, and uh, the guys uh, that took the pictures of us, you know, uh, circled and dropped us that boat. And uh, when we got on the boat, they had another one on the boat, so we put the two uh, antennas together, and we had the double. Bit. We couldn't even see uh, what the antenna, the box, the uh, box uh, ended up going above the uh, clouds. <laughs> we couldn't see it, so they were really getting out, knew where we were. <laughs> uh. Well, it sounded like there was an, a, another lucky incident as far as this. You have to talk, to talk about this now. You're now, now on the, the boat that they had dropped you. Uh, tell your story from here oh, on. Oh, yeah. Uh, they dropped us that boat. When they dropped us, it, it didn't... Uh, uh, when it hit the water, it came down on one nose, and that was the end uh, our motors were in. So we did, couldn't use the motor, and uh, the ship that he dropped was about a 17-foot, I think it was, I don't know. But 
but the deck is here and the, and the, rail, the railing was about that high. So we, everybody had to be either sat down or lay down. And uh, they dropped us, uh, uh, or didn't drop us, they uh, uh, gave us a court, uh, the way we were go to, to uh, England. And uh, uh, so we had to put up uh, our sail. And uh, I laid all night with that between my legs, we're pointed towards uh, England. But then it was, luckily, did go out of the sail boat. <laughs> so I laid there all night, pointed in one direction, but we were going back to, uh, towards France, which was lucky, because at night we saw the, uh, the horizon uh, searchlights. And uh, uh, the flares on those that boat were little ones; it didn't go very far. So the next day, 4:30 the after next afternoon, why air sea rest the sweet uh, English cable with their PT boat to pick us up, uh, and so of course they do where we are at. <laughs> but anyway. When we got, uh, when they started picking us up, one of the best things that happened was they started rubbing us with the Turkish towel boy and a couple of shots of scotch. <laughs> but, but uh, I think it was a, it was a cold night out. Uh, oh, oh, you're wet. It was March. I think it was. It was a sale in the deal. I think it was March. But anyway. Uh, you're wet, so you're freezing your butt all the way through there. Uh -huh. But uh, that scotch was good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so they took uh, took you back to to England and back to your base, and uh, yeah, and uh, you given time to to recuperate before. Yeah, I think we had a week off, and we had real fun, you know, going to different places. And uh, then uh, he came in and said, that was our 14th, you know. So we got had to start going again on the 15th. But, uh, again, something good happened. Got chopped out again. That, and that's a good thing? <laughs> well, 19th mission got shot down. On your 19th? So <coughs> yeah, five, five missions later, huh? Five missions later, got shot up again. <coughs> we were going up, we were flying up, going to go over Germany, but way up over Denmark. And was going to, over the Baltic, and then go back again to Germany. But uh, on the way over Denmark, uh, fighters hit us. And they screwed up our number one engine. And uh, they run out of oil while we were, but we end up going on in to drop our uh, uh, bone bombs, you know, but the car the target we were after was uh, covered up, we couldn't see it, find it. But we had to come back out again and so we dropped our bombs on the tar what we call the tar target of what they had. Second choice. Or? Yeah, and uh, Stettin. And at that point in time, the oil had got out a number one engine, and at the windmill, at the prop, instead of going the right way, it was going backwards. See? And so we were just vibrated like hell, so we couldn't go back over any farther. In Sweden is where we ended up. That was a hard time. Oh boy. So uh, were you able to land the plane or did you have to bail out? No, or? We, we landed the plane. Uh, <coughs> uh, they <coughs> When we came in, well, I, they, evidently the pilots do 
for the goal here on a deal like that. And, uh, but when we went in, we were hunting for the airport and we started circling. But on the way in, come to find out, uh, the fighter pilot was after us again. But the Swedes went up, their, their fighter pilots went up and scared them off, shot them out of the back at them and everything, you know. <clears throat> and so, but when we were going in, they, we didn't have nowhere to go, where to land. So we got down around 500 feet and, and it was circling, you know, and we ended up over the, the shipyard, which was a dome hole. And we got shot with their, the Swedes shot us in, in the radio room with the, their AK. And I looked back there and it was smoky. And I saw the radio man's shoes set there. I thought, oh my God. So I ran up there and he wasn't there. He was up front tearing up some papers we, we were supposed to tear up, you know. And the shoes I saw, I forgot, it was, you take a tie your shoes together and then tie them on, the, on your parachute. So when you have to fly, bail out while well, you got some shoes to wear. Because even the shoes were uh, covered up with the uh, yeah. Warm stuff too. <laughs> uh, wow. But anyway, uh, we ended up. Well, I've got some pictures I'll show you. Uh -huh. That uh, we ended up. Uh, the Swedes came along and took a uh, fighter pilot, took us in, into where we could land, which was Balmo. And uh, so we landed real good. And I jumped out of a plane the waste, waste area. And there were these guys in their uniforms and guns. I thought I, <laughs> and it was Swedes. <laughs> but uh, I guess they didn't know what would happen either. But anyway, from then on, ended up in Sweden and we had to wear civilian clothes and uh, uh, I got my air, uh, flight pay, overseas pay, and my regular pay. What was your status? Were you considered prisoners of war, or uh, just uh, what? Well, what they, they have your status down as? Well, or internees, but coming back uh, I, on paperwork, as far as the, the government was concerned, yeah. here. I got a P.O.D. Probably, uh, P.O. Prisoner of Operation. <laughs> but uh, we didn't have, uh, the first uh, place we went, why we were all together, and uh, but we had to wear some, get some wearing clothes, wear them. And later on, they moved some of us back up farther in Sweden. But even up there, it wasn't, uh, we could go anywhere we wanted. But if we go to town, we had to say, get a permit, you know. Uh -huh. no, no, nothing to sneak out of. And uh, those places where they had us was something like our uh, big motels now. Huh. So, uh, and so conditions were pretty good for you then? Yeah, they even had girls there to take care of the laundry and stuff. You know. Is that right? Girls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Probably you hadn't seen a whole lot. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, uh, and then uh, I served. Now why couldn't uh, you get back to England? Uh, why couldn't somebody come get you? or? Uh, well, you we had to stay there. And they even had Germans and Japanese in Sweden. Huh. And uh, was there a lot of Americans as well? Oh yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, 
We never did. Well, one time in Stockholm, uh, some guys got screwed up as Japanese, and they were fighting. But, uh, so you interacted with the Germans and the Japanese then? Or? Well, we did. Oh. Really. Uh, but they just went and while they, uh, while they were up there basking around, they got together some way. But uh, what they ended up doing, <coughs> what it was, was they take so many Germans and so many Japs and so many Americans and send them back. So you had to wait your turn. Oh, okay. See. And, uh, what, what, what was Sweden neutral? Yeah. Oh, okay, 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 like gotcha. Switzerland was too. Yeah, yeah, I knew Switzerland was. I wasn't yeah. aware of Sweden. Yeah. Okay, that explains it. Okay. But you got it. We were just like civilians. We're done. We, with our pay and cigarettes, we got a cap card of cigarettes a month. Or we, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, we were making more money than the Sweden guys, and, and they didn't like that at all. <laughs> what would you do with your time? What would you, what would you uh, guys do with your time? Well, we had so many guys. We had parties and stuff, and uh, see, we had to like. For meals, I had to go into uh, a restaurant or a hotel or whatever to, to get your meals. So you're back and forth, you got it, shopping, whatever. And uh, uh, when you work, when you work, we're going in as more the world to get something to eat. With a meal, you got 15 centimeters of booze. And boy, that was good, you know. But it was just enough to get to the tent. So we ordered, we had enough money. We'd order another meal and say, bring us the booze. <laughs> uh. And uh, we, we had fun. Best way to fight a war, I'll tell you. <laughs> I was there 15 months. Uh. Now, were you able to get communications like, uh, mail and such from home. Oh yeah. 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 So your parents knew your status and fi finally, yeah. Okay. They, <coughs> they uh, my folks got a uh, uh, what's the telegram? Or? Telegram that uh, I was missing in contact. Uh, war, missing in action. Oh. Jamal, your parents ever after the war ever talk about what they were thinking when they got oh, that? Yeah. Oh yeah. But it wasn't too long after that that uh, they contacted the, uh, the American vacation, I guess, and let them know that uh, uh, I was okay. And then we started writing letters back and forth like nobody's business. <laughs> and then it was uh, after the war. Uh, Germany surrendered then that you were able to go home or at, or, did, or did your number come up and did no, you get right, right after the war okay <clears throat> so while we were there uh, instead of living in uh, those motels you know where all the guys I went on uh, what we called detached service <clears throat> because there were more damn planes coming into Malmo. So I went on detached service and went down to Malmo to uh, help fix, uh, take the good parts off of one plane and put it on another and so on. And uh, so I had to get an apartment, just like, uh, like here, get an apartment and go to work there, boy, and, and get it. As long as you didn't get in any trouble with the Swedes, why well, you were okay. So. And huh. uh, go on, dance, go to the dance halls at night and so on. Huh. But, uh, that's the way to fight a war. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember where you were and what you were thinking when you heard that uh, Germany had surrendered? Uh, not really. 
in a way, yeah, we, uh, uh, I was down, down um, in Malibu and uh, heard about it, went to, uh, and boy, did we have a party. Jeez. <laughs> it really had a room. Huh. But uh, then, I don't remember how long after that way, then uh, we ended up, uh, they had to take uh, a bunch of our planes back that we fixed to fly. And uh, the guys did fly them back to somewhere in England. And uh, uh, then the war, then go home. How, how much longer then after uh, you got back to England before you shipped home to, to the States, do you remember? Not really. Yeah. <coughs> I really don't. Uh, Ended up, uh, had to go uh, by boat. Back to the States? Back to the States, uh, I don't remember how long it was before we had to. Uh, how was, the, how was that, uh, that trip home? Uh, terrible. Uh, I've heard nothing but terrible stories of, about those crossings. Oh, God, I tell you. Make it happen. <laughs> uh. You said, you know, being in, in uh, Sweden was the, the best way to fight the war. You, you saw probably the worst part way to fight the war being up in those, in those planes. Uh, I, I think the 8th Army took some of the worst casualties of the whole war as a unit. Um, how did you deal with the, the stress and, the, and it, it must have been terrifying. How do, you, how, do you, how do you keep your senses about you in a situation like that? Well, I don't know. You just... Uh Think positive is about the only thing. But uh, in looking back, uh, like I told you, there were so many things that happened that at, one, at the point in time it happened, it was a good thing. Like, like uh, that ditching, I finally got a boat, and it was good, you know. And, of course, nobody knew how to sail a boat. Because otherwise you would have sailed back into enemy territory. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. So, sometimes these turn out for the best. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh. What was it like once you got back to the States and were discharged, uh, going from military life back to civilian life? Was that much of a, uh, a change for you, and an adjustment for you? or? No, no, not really. There were a bunch of us, you know, that ended up coming back about the same time. And uh, uh, I was out in California at the time. That's where you were discharged out in California? Yeah. So then the folks there had come out there, and some of our relations came out there, but we ended up coming back to Fort Collins. But I couldn't tell you how, how, what the time schedule was. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. And then? My mem memory isn't all that good anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it goes on one, one ear and not the other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then after the war, you went on. What, what, tell us a little bit about your career and your life after the war. Uh, well, we came in. Uh, See, we came to Fort Collins in 37, but after the war, came back here. Oh, and yeah, started, started selling shoes for the And uh, that was doing all right, but not very good pay. And uh, so I ended up going to Cheyenne and, uh, for a company in Allen Edmund Shoe Company. And uh, they had a clothing store with a shoe stuff area on top, on the balcony. So I was in charge of that. I, I took care of that. And uh, uh, ended up doing a hell of a lot better. <laughs> but, but then, I'll tell you, uh, 
one of the gals <coughs> that uh, was working there, her husband worked at uh, International Harvester. And so I ended up going over there, getting a job at International. And for a while, I was working in the office. And uh, uh, then I ended up getting a job of uh, travel, traveling. <coughs> uh, I was in charge of the refrigeration, selling the refrigeration. And, uh, I thought, boy, international hours, I can retire, you know. But I sure learned things. <laughs> that uh, international moved all of their stuff down in Denver. And all of us guys were that part, you know. And uh, I tell you, but I still had the job of traveling, which was all right. But uh, living through it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh. Well, how do you think uh, the war affected your life, your experiences? It, it, what, how did it play in your, well, in your life, do you I'll think? I'll tell you one thing that uh, on the way back, uh, I don't when I was thinking about it, but I just got back, I was thinking, really, the guys graduating from high school should go to the, uh, have to go through two years of the military. Well, you learn so much. You, you can, can really go through things easier, you know. You think better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, as we uh, kind of wind down this interview, is there anything that I didn't ask you, or anything else that you'd like to talk about that we didn't we didn't go over? Well, the girls in Sweden. Oh, we talked about that. Sure. <laughs> yeah. How was the interaction with the with the uh, oh, the local people? Were they were oh, they friendly great, to you? Great. Or? Great. Yeah. Great. In fact, I got a picture in there that uh, one of the girls I damn near brought home. Is that right? Yeah. But I went go to dances all the time, and I've met some good ones. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, have you have you been back back uh, to your England or Sweden since? Uh, well, since the war. Any years after? I had chances to go, but. Uh, didn't have the money to do it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we'll wind down this interview, and then we'll we'll go over and, and uh, take some pictures of uh, your various paraphernalia you have on the table. But uh, any closing comments you'd like to make uh, in regards to anything? Well, it's amazing. I read your article in the paper, but I didn't read the little square, and I was. Having a hell of a time finding that uh, telephone for you because you're not in any of the directories. <laughs> and, and I thought my niece takes care of me sometimes, so when I get sick, I, uh, and uh, she said she tried to get it. And one day I was looking at I've got the audio, and I was going through it, and I saw this. <laughs> I finally found it. I got I got so pissed off that I forgot <laughs> forgot that. <laughs> uh, but uh, that book that I showed you, uh, I don't know where he gets all of his information. What's the name of the book for uh, viewers that may want to check it out or read it? I'll, I'll grab uh, it for you here. I just, I don't, uh, <coughs> it's Masters of the Air, and it's Donald L. <coughs> Miller, he's the author of it. 
And that's about the 8th Air Force or about bombers in particular or what side? America's bombers uh, who fought the, the air war against Nazi Germany. Okay. Uh, well, here's a picture of him. But, uh, uh, I, I haven't read a lot, lot of that. Uh, but, uh, he talks about uh, times where uh, the uh, Germans had uh, rockets uh, from the planes. I never saw any of that. No? Huh. Well, I think that was probably later in the war. At that time, you were probably in, in Sweden by then, maybe. Yeah, I think it was towards the end of the war when they started using rockets. Yeah. Uh, did you ever, uh, through the years, keep in touch with your crew members or anybody's from... Uh, well, yeah, uh, but uh, I think we're all dead now, I think. In fact, yesterday was my birthday. Oh, that's right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's right, we were going to meet for your birthday, that's right. Uh, and, and how old are you? 84. 84. Uh, but, uh, and I had an aunt that lived to be 93 that I used to take care of years ago. And uh, I'd take her to these places where she could go through the aisle and pick out what she wanted. Anyway, one day we were near mobile home out there. I don't know what we were talking about, but uh, she uh, uh, she looked at me. And she's down like this, you know. She looked at me and says, "You know what?" I said, "What?" Whoever said these were the golden years is full of shit. <laughs> oh, she was something else. I'll tell you. Uh, but, uh, but what, no kidding, all this reading what I've read of that, I just uh, can't figure out how he got read, read all the names and their conversations and all this. Yeah, yeah. So it's a good book. Uh, gives people a good idea of what uh, the bombardier life was like. And yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I want to thank you for uh, participating in this project, well, and uh, more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Well, I charge for that. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a picture of the waste gunner where the, it's an open window where I put my gun out, and, and the wind goes right through you. And the top there is the uh, navigator and the airport or the uh, cockpit. That's, That's my uh, Christmas card to my grandmother in 1943. <laughs> well, that, that's our crew, and we're, we got back, we all we got back. Now, which, which one are you? I'm, <laughs> where am I? <laughs> which one were you? I'm clear over here on the bottom. Okay. This is the size of the bullets we use in 50 caliber machine guns out the window. How many rounds would you usually shoot on a on a mission? Oh, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> you never could keep track of that. Yeah. And this is went through the war with me, and uh, this is uh, black black tape to keep the noise out, and then in here we've got soft stuff on the ears. So they wouldn't uh, sw sweat and uh, get uh, frostbite. But that—that's an English type. And the and the wires hanging out uh, hooked you up to communications uh, up front. Yeah, these are. Uh, yeah, you can uh, talk to the pilot, co-pilot, everybody on the plane. And that was uh, warm enough for your head. Kept your head warm enough. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
that quite a big 